Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start with uh, a little bit of history, uh, really, to hopefully set the scene for some of our discussions today. In 1874, a ship surveying the Pacific Ocean measured a depth of 8,513 metres, setting a depth measurement record that would stand for another 20 years. On that same survey in the Pacific, that ship also revealed the hitherto unimagined undulations of the seafloor, revealing the existence of several seamounts made 500 measurements of deep-sea temperatures, collected deep-sea bottom samples, including coral fragments from the tops of seamounts. The name of that ship was the USS Tuscarora. <laughs> so why are we here having a meeting, quite rightly entitled Beyond Challenger? Why do we celebrate the voyage of HMS Challenger as laying the foundations of modern oceanography and not some of the other voyages of exploration and discovery that were taking place at the same time? So what I'd like to discuss with you first this morning is what were the factors that came together to produce that successful impact from the voyage of HMS Challenger. And the thesis I'd like to lay out for you is that I think there are really two key factors. First of all, HMS Challenger had a unique combination of two strong drivers behind it, what we might call a strategic driver and a scientific driver, whereas many other expeditions at that time only really had one of those two as a strong driver. And secondly, it was what the Challenger team and their colleagues did after the expedition that really laid the foundations um, for modern oceanography as a result of that expedition. So we'll have a look at, uh, at, at those factors. Now, I'm not a historian, as many of you uh, know. I'm a, I'm a biologist, uh, but I've been fascinated by this. It's a rabbit hole I've, I've disappeared into whilst researching a book recently. Um, so hopefully uh, I'll be able to share some of that uh, stuff that's fascinated me with you this morning. So I'd like to begin by tracing the strategic driver that led to the voyage of HMS Challenger. And for this, let's go back a couple of decades, slightly more than a couple of decades, before the voyage of HMS Challenger, and start with one of the very big names, of course, in ocean science, Matthew Fontaine Maori. Now, many of you will be familiar uh, with Maori. Maori joined the US Navy against the wishes of his father, his older brother, had died in the service of yellow fever. His father did not want him to follow his brother into the Navy, yet he did. He served at sea. He took part in the round-the-world voyage of the USS Vincennes, the US Navy's first round-the-world voyage. But then a stagecoach accident broke his leg very badly, put an end to his seagoing career, and then he'd already published two uh, books on, on navigation and so on, so he became superintendent of the, the sort of Department of Meteorology, what eventually became the United States Naval Observatory, collating information coming ashore from US Navy ships. Meteorology, tides, etc., but also bathymetry, depth measurements. And he was also trying to standardise the techniques um, that US naval ships were using to collect uh, that information. And he published some of the first bathymetric charts, in particular of the North Atlantic. He published one in 1853, uh, and then subsequently, because every depth measurement at that point was a pinprick in such a vast unknown, uh, in 1854 he had to publish an updated version, uh, including some recently taken soundings by USS Dolphin in the Mid-Atlantic. And his map of 1854 that you can see here, now it's a slightly different to what we're used to today, the darker stippling shading actually indicates shallower water, uh, so it looks a little bit odd to us today. But essentially what this map indicated, as he sketched the contours between joining the dots as it were, was the existence of a slightly shallower plateau, certainly running north of the Azores across the middle of the Atlantic, a first glimpse of part of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This was potentially of interest to Samuel Morse for the laying of deep sea telegraph cables. Morse was, was interested in where would be a good place to lay the first submarine telegraph cable across the Atlantic. He eventually got in touch with Maori. This feature is one of the first named features that we have in the deep ocean. It was nicknamed Telegraph Plateau or Telegraphic Plateau, as it looked like a good place to attempt the first cable laying which happened fairly swiftly thereafter. So the Dolphin went and did some further surveys uh, to, to, with this in mind. The, uh, uh, the Britain uh, reciprocated, sending HMS Cyclops to also do some transects uh, and start to map this area out. Uh, and eventually, we had the first transatlantic connection laid uh, and operational in 1858. And I think it's hard for us today to imagine what a revolution 
this was in communications. I think this is right up there with the inventing of the printing press. The modern world as we know it was born in this moment because previously communication with another continent to send a message and get a reply would take weeks. Now it can take hours. So political communication between world powers, commercial communication about you know, crops and commodities and so on and the people that are going to be using them, and also a global media reporting of events from far away much more rapidly. The world as we know it today was really forged through this. However, and at the Times indeed, the front page of the Times on the day of the first message being sent was extremely buoyant uh, and wrote, the Atlantic is dried up and we come in reality as well as in wish one country. Unfortunately, the first connection did not last very long. It only lasted a matter of weeks. And to give you a little bit of the history behind that, I'd like to introduce the first of a real panoply of fellows of the Royal Society whose stories interweave with that of HMS Challenger. And here we have William Thompson, who later, of course, Lord Kelvin, first Baron Kelvin, uh, and he was eventually president of the Royal Society uh, as well at the end of, of the century. Now, he was a director of the Atlantic Telegraph Company that was responsible for that first connection, and very much in that role as a scientific advisor. However, the chief electrician on this project was a character called Edward Wildman, as his nickname, Wildman White, White, uh, Whitehouse. He was actually a medical doctor originally, but he was interested in electricity and had done some experiments and and got involved in designs of cables and so on, and they did not really see eye to eye, in particular over the operation of the cable. It was clear on when this cable was laid there were problems with its operation. In particular, how do you send a signal over such a long distance down a copper cable? Kelvin had done the research and had found out that basically the, the cross-section uh, of your conductor needs to be of a certain size to be able to propagate that signal. So on Wildman, on the other hand, a White House, on the other hand, believed that if you gave it a big enough kick of voltage, you could send the signal any distance. Uh, and of course, Kel uh, uh, William Thompson said, no, you risk burning out, damaging the cable. So there was an argument over the operation of the cable as its signal declined. White House, in the end, cranked up the voltage and the cable failed. <laughs> so, sadly, it was not, the first one was not a lasting connection, but a lot was learned. And eventually, in 1866, the first lasting connection came, also repairing another one attempted in 1865. It was laid using the, the, the paddle steamship, SS Great Eastern, which was designed, of course, by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He wasn't alive to see this, unfortunately. He died in, in 1859, but his ship laid the first successful cable. Uh, and the rest, in terms of communication, is, as we say, uh, history. So this was a real revolu world revolution at this time, and many governments had an eye on the strategic economic importance of submarine telegraph cables. Interested in scouting routes, Britain, of course, having a worldwide empire at that time, we need to join up that empire for communications. Other countries interested in cable routes, economic opportunities for, for companies in, in different countries in that new industry. So that was a driver, a very strong driver, um, for HMS Challenger. It was understanding the nature of the seabed with a view to laying submarine telegraph cables. It was also the driver for that voyage of USS Tuscarora. That survey was to scout the route for potential telegraph cables from California to Hawaii and on to Japan. Um, so that's a str strategic driver that was for HMS Challenger. So very much sort of applied research, economic uh, sort of dimension. But other expeditions had that at that time. Challenger also had a strong scientific driver. So I'd now like to go back and trace the origins of that. And for that, we can go back to ooh, 1839 and Edward Forbes. Familiar to many of you as, a, as one of the first deep sea biologists, Forbes' azoic theory, of course, that he published in 1843, suggesting that on the basis of declining abundance of life in his trawls in the Aegean down to about 400 metres, that actually deep sea life might peter out by 600. Unfortunately, of course, the Aegean being a little bit atypical of the deep ocean in that regard, but a fantastic hypothesis to put forward. But Forbes also was a founder member of an organisation called the Dredging Committee of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, which started that the Dredging Committee began in, in 1839. The actual British Association began only nine years earlier in 1830. And they were interested in what might live in the deep ocean. It was a pure scientific uh, sort of curiosity uh, and therefore they were hiring private vessels to try and trawl in deeper and deeper waters. Uh, Forbes managed to get a Royal Naval vessel for his work in the Aegean uh, and that was really important in stimulating the curiosity of the scientific community 
in that time about the deep ocean. So Forbes, very important, not just for his azoic theory, but also for his, his work with the dredging committee in laying these foundations. And then really carrying on from Forbes with the dredging committee, Gwyn Jeffries, malacologist, uh, also really took us up through the 1860s uh, with work with the, with the dredging committee uh, and interested in going into deeper and deeper water and indeed testing and overturning Forbes' azoic hypothesis. This ultimately, of course, culminated in the charter of some Royal Naval vessels through the Royal Society for scientific purposes. HMS Lightning, okay, in 1868. And here's a, a chart of the, the route of the Lightning. So this is, Sc oh, this is not uh, shining, never mind, but you can see Scotland down the bottom. You know, hopefully you can make out where they went. Uh, so very important, and not just sampling the seabed, what's living on the seabed, down to you know, increasing depth, setting new records for doing so, but also making measurements of temperature, you know, collecting samples, looking at chemistry, multidisciplinary uh, approach to understanding the deep ocean, which was really novel at that time. So, success of lightning, short campaign in, in 68, uh, and then HMS Porcupine, 1868, uh, 1869, 18, 1870. Uh, and this sketch on the left that you can see here of the dredge coming back, that was actually sketched by Charles Wyville Thompson, who later, of course, was chief scientist of uh, the Challenger expedition. Uh, so Porcupine, you can see here, uh, a, a paddle vessel, uh, and huge success. I mean, collected animal samples from more than 4,400 metres deep in the Celtic Sea. So that, that really put a nail in the coffin of, of Forbes' azoic theory. Although that did, for midwater, that did actually echo on after Challenger with ideas that midwater might be uh, not very much populated. Uh, but this was really revolutionary. And it was that multidisciplinary insight, and also measuring different layers of water in, in around the, uh, um, what's now the, well, the Wyville, south of the Wyville Thompson Ridge, uh, Rockall Trough and so on. So oceanography and marine biology coming together to open up what Maori has described just two decades earlier as the sealed interior of the oceans, opening that up like never before, stimulating so much scientific curiosity, separate really from submarine telegraph cables. This is the other key driver behind Challenger. And here we have one of the veterans of lightning and porcupine, and, of course, the instigator, really, of the Challenger expedition, though he was too old at 61 to go on the expedition himself, William, or lead it himself, William Carpenter. Now, in 1871, Carpenter gave a talk at the Royal Institution, and his talk was subsequently reported in the journal Nature. Uh, and, indeed, this is what he was quoted as having said at the Royal Institution. Having shown other nations the way to treasures of knowledge, which lie hid in the recesses of the ocean, we are falling from the van into the rear, leaving our rivals to gather everything up. Is this credible to the power which claims to be mistress of the seas? So, really, you know, a bit of tub-thumping national pride there. <laughs> and Carpenter worked incredibly hard lobbying the government on the success of lightning and porcupine, this multidisciplinary approach plans for a round-the-world voyage of exploration and discovery. And it took a lot of lobbying, so this kind of thing, and also mobilising 19th century science. Living scientists at the time, who he got on side to speak out and support different aspects, different scientific vistas that a round-the-world voyage would offer, so, you know, it, it's a sort of a who's who of the great and good. Charles Lyell for biology, John Tyndall for physics, Huxley for biology, building on the work of earlier 19th century scientists, you know, people like William Herschel, whose early work from 18th through 19th century. Even astronomy might benefit. We'd seen the benefits of Cook's voyage to measure the transit of Venus and so on. So the idea that everybody, the whole scientific community, could benefit from this venture was definitely the message that was put across. So with those two the strategic driver plus that scientific driver, yes, eventually, of course, the government fan funded this, instructed the Admiralty to find a corvette, fit it out, and the Challenger expedition, as we know it, took place, of course. Uh, but it's also what happened after Challenger that I think helped to secure uh, its legacy. Because it wasn't just, here's the expedition, here are some measurements, here are some samples. It was very much there post-expedition plans that helped to lay their foundation. So, of course, one of the key players in that, another FRS, John Murray. Uh, Murray took over from Wyville Thompson the publication, subsequent publication of the Challenger Reports, 
ultimately culminating in 50 volumes, each as thick as a Bible, is how they were described. Uh, but you know, 100, around about 100 uh, scientists involved in analysing the samples, the data, producing these reports. And crucially, as part of the deal of funding of the expedition initially, this whole set of 50 volumes provided and disseminated free to several scientific institutions around the world. And it was this, I mean, it took till 1899 was, I think, when the last set of Challenger reports were sent out as part of that arrangement. That post-cruise period, that bio, you know, what we, bioinformatics type effort, if you like, that, I think, was what's really key to securing the success. Tuscarora, if we go and compare, go back and compare with Tuscarora, did not have that. It was primarily hydrographic. The data came back to eventually what was the US Naval Observatory. There were some hydrographic reports. It was not disseminated to the scientific community in the same way, which was very unfortunate. I, you know, I, I think we should celebrate the Tuscarora perhaps a little bit more, uh, in particular George Belknap, who was captain um, of the Tuscarora, because... Challenger, in some ways, was not that innovative. Certainly, its depth measurement technique, William Thompson had devised a wonderful um, wire-sounding depth measurement device using, using actually piano wire. So, a little historical aside, we can thank John Isaac Hawkins, who was born in Taunton, Somerset in 1772, for an unsung but musical contribution to deep-sea exploration. <laughs> he invented an upright piano whose popularity among the glowing middle classes of the 19th century was so great that it led to the mass production of piano wire, which meant it was readily available at cheap cost for deep sea sounding. <laughs> so uh, Thompson's sounding machine was revolutionary, of course. Uh, it, it was delivered to Challenger, a uh, sort of prototype. They couldn't get it to work. They put it aside. They stuck with tried and tested rope-based techniques. Belknap modified it. He modified the, 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 the weighting system on it. He got it to work really well. And this is what Tuscarora did. It was a lot faster, potentially a little bit more reliable, uh, and, and they were able to make a lot of measurements with this. And, of course, subsequent modifications by other people like Charles Sigsby, you know, really set the standard uh, until we had you know, acoustic echo sounding much later. So, you know, Belknap got this thing working, uh, and Tuscarora used it to do things like discover isolated seamounts. I mean, I think Josephine Bank was the first ever detected seamount, but certainly Tuscarora found several isolated seamounts, and really revealed, under, you know, in fact, several years after, a few years after Tuscarora, Agassiz you know, said, well, the deep sea must be a very boring, monotonous, flat plain. I mean, he was not aware of the undulations that they'd already discovered because that information wasn't being disseminated really to that community um, in the same way. So, unfortunately, Tuscarora not uh, currently celebrated. Uh, here's a, uh, one of the first bath bathymetric charts of the Pacific uh, by Peterman from 1877. It has a Tuscarora deep up near the Kural Kamchatka Trench, as we call it today. There's also a Belknap deep just south of Hawaii. Neither of those names uh, still exist to describe deep sea features today. Uh, so I do feel very sorry for George Belknap because contrast that with George Nares, captain of the Challenger at the start of the voyage, Nares has got a whole abyssal plain named after him. <laughs> okay, poor old Belknap. <laughs> okay. But what I hope I can show you through that glimpse is the factors that led, quite rightly, to us celebrating Challenger as laying the foundations of our, of our modern oceanography. Uh, it's, it's legacy, very much from having those two strong drivers. Expeditions like Tuscarora just had the strategic economic, the sort of depth sounding for submarine telegraph cables. Challenger had the scientific driver. We can reflect on the situation today. Perhaps the situation today is reversed. Perhaps today there are plenty of big science questions that excite us, but we need a strong applied driver, whether it's informing design of MPAs, whether it's understanding more about anthropogenic impacts in the oceans. Challenger's success relied on having both strong drivers. And then, crucially, Challenger's legacy as well. And it's wonderful how we have this tradition uh, of NASA naming human-occupied spacecraft after ships of, of exploration. So not only the, the lunar module of Apollo 17, but of course the space shuttle Challenger uh, as well, carrying on the name. If we think about the post-cruise, post-expedition legacy of Challenger, it was very much that open access, if you like, publication, making those reports, producing them, doing all that analysis after the expedition, supporting that effort, and disseminating it to that community. And we can think about what are the modern parallels today. The one that strikes me uh, is something like the Tara Oceans expedition and its bioinformatics. There's a resource that is still being kind of mined for new insights, even now, new papers coming out um, from that. So I think there are strong threads 
that we can look at from history and reflect on um, today in our discussions. Thank you very much.